One of the, uh, the things that, that all of us wrestle with is, is you know, when you come here, uh, you come into this building, and, and uh, it's great. I, I really like this building. I, I love old churches. Um, I love this one, and I'm going to love the next one, I'm sure, it, you know, as it, as it gets there. And something about being in a building that's been around longer than you, uh, probably when your great-grandparents were born, 1895, that's right, maybe even goes back further than that. Uh, you come in these buildings, and there's a sense of history. There's a sense of what God has been doing in this room for years and years and years. I'm a big fan. I think it's great. But, but the reality is, is that uh, if, even if you're here all morning or, or, or even late tonight, you hang out, and you, you're with people a long time, you spend three, four hours at most in the building, right? You're just, that's it. And, it, and then the rest of the 168, so at least 164, you're, you're not in this building. And, and the, the question that kind of goes, goes through you during that time, when, when life comes back, I mean, right here, right now, you're all kind of listening to me, and you're thinking, you're even thinking, maybe asking God, God, could you show me something? And, and you're all kind of prepared for that. That's great. That's, it should be that way. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. I like to go to church services and, and ask one question. God, just, just will you show me yourself? I don't care if I don't like the style of music or, or if whatever the preacher, if, you know, style isn't my personal style, whatever. God, would you show me yourself? And so that's great. But then you leave here, and then just life collides with the theology you just hit, right? And stuff happens. You know, you, you, you walk around, and, and, and you walk out of a, a BWWs, and your back window is blown out of your truck. For instance, hypothetically speaking. <laughs> and so it's like, those moments, those moments, where is God, right? Well, those moments, when, when this whole thing just isn't the way it is seems like it's supposed to be. And it is at that time in, in life, and everybody goes through it, all right? Everybody. I go completely through this. Uh, and, and I imagine everybody does. You just, how do you intersect real life, real struggle, real crisis, real pain with this transcendent, this great understanding, this great view of God? How does, where does that hit? And there's a, there's a, a passage that Jesus or a, something that Jesus said, a passage that we quote often at Hope. And I quote it often because I don't really believe it. Well, sure, I believe it. If you ask me whether or not it's true, I'm going to vote yes. But if you really ask me not whether or not, I, I don't know. And the, the, the verse is John 16, 33. In John 16, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. The book of John is set up so that by the time you get to the later chapters of John, which starts around chapter 14, 15, you start to get to the point where Jesus is already on the last week of his life. So almost half the book, roughly or so, is, is Jesus' end of his ministry, way more than the other Gospels. And Jesus says something to these followers, and he says this. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now just stop right there for a second. That would imply that... That just normal living or in, in life, the way life goes, you don't live necessarily a life of peace within you. Now, peace does not mean the absence of trouble. Or the next sentence doesn't make any sense. Because he says, I've told you these things so that in me you might have peace. Then he gives this promise. In this world you will have trouble. I, I, I know that. And I, if you ask me whether I believe it, I vote yes. Until I walk out and see the back window of my suburban busted out. It's like, oh, what's the deal? Why me? Why not the next guy? Well, it actually was the next guy too. But, but uh, <laughs> why not the next guy who didn't get it? You know, what's the deal? Right? We don't actually believe this. And then he goes on to say, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now think about that just for a second. Somebody comes up to you and says, I got a promise for you. You're going to have trouble. <laughs> okay? There's going to be trouble in your life. But don't worry about it. I've overcome the world. My thought was, well, good for you. <laughs> How does that help me, right? Now, it's interesting. How does he say to overcome this trouble? He gives the answer. It's sandwiched in between those, that thought, in this world, you have trouble. The first thing he says, so that in me, you will have peace. And then he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. So in other words, the answer isn't buck up. The answer isn't change your mind. 
The answer isn't look for the little, little shaft of sunlight coming because it's going to be right around the corner. yippity doo da. Here we go. Right? That's not the answer. The answer is Jesus. Right? Jesus. Jesus is the answer. In him, I have peace. And because he's overcome the world and I'm in him, I will overcome this stuff. But when I'm not in him and I don't decide to say, hey, Lord, I am in you and you matter on everything and busted out windows are busted out where it windows. That's trouble, okay? But is it going to define me? Is it going to drag me down? Are all those things going to do it? The answer is Jesus. I don't even know what your question is tonight. I know your answer. Jesus. I don't even know my questions at times, but I know the answer. And the answer is Jesus. We are, um, are going to embark on a, we're starting a brand new series tonight, and this will take us this week and then nine more weeks. It's going to be a 10-week series. It is unlike any series we've ever done at Hope before. You'll see why by the end of it. It's kind of shocking, actually, <laughs> to be honest with you. When you really look at this, it's kind of like, really? We're going to spend 10 weeks on this? We really are. We're going to journey through the book of Esther together. Esther. We're calling it a reversal of fortunes. We're going to see how this book actually kind of twists several places. And all these different characters, things kind of twist on them uh, all throughout the book. And it's, a, it's an amazing book. It's a shocking book, though. I'm not going to lie. It's a very shocking book. So if you've got a Bible with you, we're going to cover four verses tonight. Tonight is an invitation. Tonight is an overview. Tonight is kind of whet your appetite for what we hope God is going to do in our lives over the next nine more weeks. And my prayer is that we do not end up the same people or the same church, as I always pray this every series, that, and hope this for us as a people, that we end up being different people on the other end of it. And I think if you let this, I think this book will hit you and hit you hard if you will let it, if you will allow it to do it. So Esther, uh, chapter 1. And if you uh, have a Bible, it's kind of towards the middle. Ezra, Nehemiah, I guess kind of left the middle. Ezra, Nehemiah, then Esther, and then Job, right? Is that right? <laughs> Job, uh, right. So Esther, all right? We're going to read it, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time just kind of not going to really go over the, too much of this particulars here. We'll start that next week. Esther chapter 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes, the, the Xerxes, who ruled, now I like that, I like when a person becomes the. You know, I want to someday be the Steve. This, <laughs> the Steve. No? Steve, yeah. That's Steve. The Steve. But anyway. Who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He gives a big party. Huge party. We'll read about it. Uh, coming in the, in the days coming. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes, and all the nobles were present for a full 180 days. He displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. They partied for half a year. You think frat parties are big diggle? Big diggle. Just made that up. <laughs> Booyah! Xerxes has you. 180 days. Baby, this is a party. All right? Now, uh, we're going to go over an uh, overview. I, you can just feel free. I'm not going to spoil the book. Uh, spoil it. You can read it on your own. It's okay. But, but I'm not going to go into that. But if there are things tonight that you uh, want to talk, we'll have a little Q&A time. If there's anything you want to talk about, talk about the... Uh, the, the some of the things. If you want to jot down a question or something, make sure it's relevant to what we're talking about here. If you have something totally irrelevant but important, I'm happy to hang out afterwards and we can talk about it. But, but if you have something about Esther, we're going to have a little live q and It's what we try to do on third service. That's why third service rocks. Well, there's a variety of reasons, but that's the best. Now, let's get after this. I just want to kind of uh, give you a few things, kind of give you some, some parameters to understand this book because it is a difficult book. Very difficult. What's going on in this book? Well, first off, let's start with the main characters, okay? You've got some main characters in the book. And I'm going to give you the four main characters. First, you have Esther, 
All right? That's not an actual picture, uh, but that's, you, you get the concept. There's Esther. Now, if you have a, 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 a lady, and, and Esther's going to turn out to be a lovely, beautiful lady, you have to have somebody smarmy. Smarmy. And you have this smarmy guy, you can kind of tell by his beard. Dudes, <laughs> do not crop your beard close. Where's Dietrich? I saw him today. There you go. Back there. That's, Dietrich's a lot of things. He ain't smarmy. He's got a beard. I tell you what, when Dietrich walks into his room, his beard walks about three minutes ahead of him into the room. This beard, thank you very much. Dietrich, you just got, that is a beard. I would grow one of those if I could. I can, but uh, the lady of the house won't allow it. <laughs> so, I know, I know. Everybody's got their cross to bear. But, smarmy beard, smarmy guy, Haman. His name is Haman. We're going to see this guy. And then there's another guy. And his name is Mordecai. And Mordecai is an interesting duck. Completely. You could say he's a, he's a, he's a uh, deal pr uh, broker. You could say he's a, someone who's a mediator on certain things. That'd be the nice way of saying it. Probably more like a um, uh, manipulator, uh, someone's self-interest, and maybe even smarmy himself. There's some serious smarmage going on there. I just coined, I'm not even sure if smarmy's a word. If you make up smarmy, then you could make up smarmage as well, I suppose. So there's those three. And then the last one, we already read about him, is the king. So you got the king of Xerxes. <laughs> King Xerxes right there, so. <laughs> actually, I was, uh, I raised the kids on Veggie Tales, and I'm actually amazed, it's, it's actually pretty good. It's like the, the equivalent to flannel graph for kids now, so that'll be the, the thing they're, they're ranking them. Okay, now, what's going on in the book? I'm not gonna give you the storyline. We're gonna let the storyline take on. It takes place over a period of about 10 years, and we'll see this thing unfold, and we're gonna walk right through the story and, and let it land. But the interesting thing about uh, it's ten chapters, it's, it's nine chapters. The tenth chapter, if you flip to it, it's actually three verses. So I don't know who was doing this when they numbered the, the Bible chapters, but whoever it was, ten, three verses. We're going to cover that in, in with chapter nine. We're going to do a chapter where we can follow the story. It really does follow along the chapter divisions except for chapter ten. And it, and it just kind of flows uh, different things taking place along the way. And it's telling a story. It's all a story. Believe me, it's all a story. You'll see in just a minute. Very much a story. And when you hear a story, things start to come up. Emotional word pictures come when you hear a story. Right? So what I did is I, I thought of as many words as I possibly could. Um, I've got a friend in St. Cloud. He's a pastor out there. His name's Matthew Molesky. And, and he and I, ha I actually changed his name from Molesky to... Uh, um, what do I call him? I call him Seamus. And his last name isn't Molesky now. It's, what do I call him? I changed it to Irish. I can't remember what I call him. But anyway, it's Seamus is his first name. I actually named his wife Molly, too. And she's, her name isn't Molly. But uh, which is, this is kind of strange that I would do this to people. But it's kind of fun. And I, I love these people. But he convinced me. He said, dude, you got to preach through Esther. I'm like, I don't know, man. Esther, are you kidding me? Uh, uh, I don't know. That's a strange, that's a strange book. And he said, no, no, you'll love it, you'll love it. And he started telling me about all the different words and, and listening to him talk about these things. I made up, a, I just came up with words. Made one of those cloud things. Let me list you the words that are going to happen. All the emotional word pictures. Pride, sensuality, jealousy, anger, malice, envy, irony, rivalry, humor, satire, partying, sex, cunning, intrigue, racism, Political corruption, abuse, vanity, I think I said vanity twice, uh, slander, hatred, love, drunkenness, manipulation, courage, beauty, ugliness, death, life, feasting, joy, and hope. And after you get a run with it, there'd be much more. There's a ton of things that this is going to rise up within you as we walk through this account. Now, let me give you a little bit of the background of what's going on. And I'm not... First of all, I'm not a historical scholar on these kind of things. You can do just as well as I can. Just get yourselves a very good commentary. Read these things. And that's what I've done. Uh, this commentary is written by, where did I get this from? It's a great commentary, and I can't find her. What's her name? It's, it's NIV application commentary, where I'm getting a lot of this history from. 
and it's, it's, it's excellent. And it really will help you to, to kind of hang your hat on what's going on. So just, I'm going to give you the, the bullet points historically, what's happening, because I think we get lost a lot of times in the Old Testament. The New Testament, too, is still 2,000 years behind us, but for some reason, we connect better. Old Testament, we get lost a little bit. Let's try a little of this. Okay, what's going on? We just finished up with the book of Genesis. Okay? Genesis. You have uh, a lot of things happening, but you get a man by the name of Abraham, and he's promised that there is going to be a great nation coming out of him. He has one son. His name is Isaac. Isaac comes, and he has a son. He actually has a couple sons. Abraham, Isaac, and it goes through Jacob. Okay? Jacob then has 12 sons. We talked about this the last few weeks of the Genesis series. There's 12 sons, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. And they start multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. The book of Genesis ends. It moves into the next book of the Bible, Exodus. And you see these people multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. There's all kinds of them. All right? And then it says, a Pharaoh came up who didn't know Joseph or never heard of him. And now he's threatened by all of these Jewish people. And he puts them in slavery. 400 years. Until Charlton Heston rises up. And comes and sets the people free, right? And so you know the whole account. You've seen it. You've seen the Ten Commandments. Uh, Moses comes and they come out. And as they go out, now they become, for the first time now, a nation on their own. Looking for their own promised land. Eventually, to fast forward the story, keep going through the Old Testament, they get their own nation. They get their own nation. They get the promised land. But, rewind back. When Moses has them in the desert, before they're going to get this spot, it takes a while to get there, but before that happens, he warns them. He says, you got to follow God. If you don't, bad things will happen. That brings us to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I would encourage you just to understand what's going on in the book of Esther. You should know what's going on in Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm only going to read three verses. It's kind of long verses, but just hang with me. Uh, Verse 15, verse 36, and verse 64 of this chapter, you'll get a feel for what's taking place. Deuteronomy 28. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So what's happening here, Moses said, there are curses going to happen if you don't follow God. Verse 36, skip down. The Lord will drive you and the king you set over you to a nation unknown to you or your fathers. There there you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone. Skip down to verse 64. Then the Lord your God will scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. So what's what's the the thing is this. You're going to get your nation. You're going to get your land. But if you, don't follow, if, you're, if you as a nation don't decide to follow God, guess what's going to happen? Someone's going to come in and, and take over your land, not just that. They're also going to take you and separate you, all scatter you all over the known world. And it happens. It happens in a multiple of different settings and a, and a multiple ways of different events. But the, the final blow is in 586 B.C. In 586 B.C., you have King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire. He comes in and he trashes downtown Jerusalem. He takes over completely the small remnant that's left. He goes in and he gets Jerusalem. He takes over all the people uh, that's left. So the Babylonian Empire comes in and cleans house. Not only that, not only does he clean house, he also destroys the city. And the highlight of the city is the temple. The place where people who are of a Jewish nationality would have put their pride in a, in a physical thing would have been the temple. Right? It's like a being an American and you're proud of this country and if you've never been to Washington, D.C., uh, you should. It's amazing. And you go to the White House and you see Library of Congress and you go to Smithsonian uh, and you go to Washington Monument, Jefferson Monument, And it would be like blowing all those up. That's what takes place when Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. tears down the temple. All right? It is, you got to think of that. Think like somebody had taken over our land, 
broken up your families, broken up your relationships, uh, broken up your tribes and your, your different people, and taken you to other lands, and then you're watching CNN and you're watching the White House being, being blown up or, or taking a crane to it, and you're watching uh, the Congress and it's being knocked down. Get it? That's what they're going through. That's what's happening to their nationalism. It's gone. Then, a guy arises. A guy arises by the name of Cyrus the Great. I'm sure he probably named himself. No one would name himself Cyrus the Wimpy or something, but Cyrus the Great. He reigns another, another empire called the Persian Empire. Okay? And he reigns them from 559 to 530 B.C. He does something that other people weren't able to do. The Persian Empire then actually conquers the world power at the time, which is the Babylonian Empire. And then it becomes known. There were Persian kings before that, but they were small potatoes. Now they are the Persian Empire. That, and so he's like the first king of this whole order. In 539, after this, he conquers uh, the, the Babylon Empire and becomes this big dog. He issues a decree, which is relevant for our study here. He issues a decree. It's like 47 years. Remember, 586 is when they get trashed. In 539, he issues a decree that says, if you want to go home, Jews, go ahead. That's crazy. Now, he gets lauded in the Bible. He's like, that's great. Good King Cyrus. Or, you know, that's nice. But he did it primarily for economic reasons. He can get them back. He can get this trashed out land rebuilt. He can tax them and the whole thing. He's thinking along those lines. He doesn't view the Jews as a threat, so it's no big deal. So he says, go home. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah, if you're at all familiar with those books, are about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Remember uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah talk about the, the wall being rebuilt up so that they won't just get sacked by different raiding armies, and then they also want to rebuild the temple. And that, that temple that they build, Second Temple Judaism, they call it, is actually the temple that is there when Jesus comes on the scene. And he's walking around, and there are, this temple is there. So it's rebuilt. So he's the first king of the modern, uh, or not modern, but I mean the, of the Persian Empire. If you skip down, he's number one, two, three, four, and then fifth king of that empire, you get a guy by the name of Xerxes. He reigns from 485 to 465 B.C., all right? So, and this is the guy I just read about. This is the guy, the Xerxes, all right? This is him. He's the fifth king. He, he tries to lead an unsuccessful uh, invasion of the only other power left besides the Persian Empire, and that's, the, and that's Greece, right? And that maybe you may ring a bell with you that uh, even though they're always at war with one another, Xerxes can never, in fact, Persia can never conquer Greece. And that's where, this is where the movie 300 comes in, right? The, the uh, Sparta, those, they were Greek, Greeks, and Xerxes, they talk about King Xerxes and that he's trying to overtake them, and the 300 stand, Spartans, right? And they, they, they make it. Somebody said I should kick something when I do that. There. Uh, watch it fall. Um, so, uh, that's what's going on. That's historically, there's, it's kind of this time of cold and hot war. Matters what's actually going on during the book of Esther between these two superpowers. That's kind of the climate. All right? Now, let me give you a few other just kind of interesting facts. Uh, you can put the filies under the, oh, that's kind of interesting. What's going on in the world at this particular time? Confucius is born right around this time in the Far East. Uh, you have a guy by the name of uh, Pericles, which is more than one coals. So Pericles. Sorry, it's daylight savings. I still not right. He creates a political system for Greece that is really the foundation of what we call modern day democracy. So he comes on the scene in Greece. Uh, Socrates was born, so and he has all of his followings in, in the philosophical realm. Pythagoras, who he was, he's not only a mathematician, Pythagorean theorem, but also establishes a school of religion, a philosophy, a lot of followers, same kind of thing. And then lastly, the Olympics. The Olympics, by the time of the Book of Esther, have about a 200-year run. And they are 
uh, they're very popular and they're gaining in uh, popularity over this. Now, that's just kind of interesting stuff about what's going on in history. Now, buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> Because this is where it gets weird, like it hasn't been weird yet. But here's where it gets really weird. Interesting facts about the book of Esther. Okay, We'll start soft and end in weird. <laughs> Here we go. First thing, this is an extremely popular book. Since it's writing, uh, up until even now, amongst Jewish readers. That's, that seems to make sense. It's a, it's a book that we'll look at first glance, and, and I think in some ways it's very true, about Jewish nationalism, and you'll see that in the book. And we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll deal exclusively with that. How do we deal with that? What is that, what is that about? Okay? It was such a big deal to people in, in the, who are, who are uh, Jewish people that one of their uh, uh, philosophers, a guy by the name of 12th century philosopher Moses, and I can't say his last name, He's, he's quoted as saying this, when Messiah comes, so he's still looking for the Messiah, when Messiah comes, the other books of the Hebrew Bible may pass away, but the Torah, which is just, remember there's 39 books in the Old Testament, the Torah is five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five, but the Torah and Esther will abide forever. So the rest, you know, <laughs> the rest of the 33, no, it doesn't really matter, we want the first five and Esther. That's got to remain. They love the book. In fact, if you, if you um, the, the Jewish people divide the Bible, the Old Testament, into parts, the third part they call the Megaloth, which stands for the scroll. There are five books in the Megaloth, and it's Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. Now, of that, if you say, what are the five books of the 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 scroll, they would say that. But if you say, I was reading in the scroll, everyone assumes you're talking about Esther. They say it's book number one. Okay? No problem yet. Problem number two. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. Uh, it's one of two Old Testament books named for women. Ruth is the other one. So that's why I put a picture of two women. Or you didn't pay anything for this, so you're getting your money. Okay. <laughs> Number three. It's the origin, the book of Esther is the origin of the Feast of Purim. Maybe you've never heard of Purim, but it's a Jewish feast, Jewish festival, in which uh, you're going to see the origin of where it takes place, and it primarily kind of kicks off in that intertestamental period between the end of the Old Testament, there's about 400 years there, and the New Testament, when those books were, were put together, at least historically when they happened, and, and there you have this feast now called Purim, and we'll talk about that when we see that. Okay, here we go. God is never mentioned in this book. Not once. No mention of him. Now, it's not that God isn't there. I'm going to argue very strongly that God is there, but not explicitly in any way, shape, or form. He is not, he, he, he doesn't speak, and he is never mentioned in the book. Not only that, but there is no miracle, there is no divine intervention, there's no one who prays, and there's no one that even speaks in theological terms. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. Let's make it even stranger. There are no New Testament quotes, not one from the entire 10 chapters of the book of Esther. Not totally uncommon. There are other books that this is the case also. A few. But not any New Testament quotes or even references regarding it. Not one. In the first 700 years of Christian history, so from 0 to 700, there is not one commentary, nor can we even find an article, just somebody writing a letter describing it about the book of Esther. 700 years. By the time the reformers came on, this is hipster John Calvin. Uh, by the time the reformers come about, they were not really a big fan. John Calvin and Martin Luther preached on everything and neither one of them had one sermon from the book of Esther. So I got that going for me. Tonight, I got that going for me. But they don't preach once. John Calvin 
who wrote commentaries on anything, primarily the books of the Bible, he does not write a commentary on Esther. Martin Luther, for those of you who are of that background, had this even to say. I am so great an enemy to the second book of the Maccabees, which is part of the Apocrypha, as we would call it as Protestants, and to Esther, that I wish they had not come to us at all, for they have too many heathen unnaturalities. Well, Martha, that's kind of strong, don't you think? Therefore, I would turn to say, how does someone that straightforward, that just hits you between the eyes, end up being the founder of what is one of the most passive-aggressive denominations in the, anyway, maybe it's just Minnesota. Maybe we're all passive-aggressive up here, but it's just crazy. Uh, this is what he thinks of this. All right. Now, Luther has a lot of, I like Luther. I would love to have hung out with Luther. Uh, he brewed his own beer, and he had tons of people living in his house. Big old table, they hung out all the time. Just, he would have been great. So they might have caught him at a bad moment, or a bad stout, or something hit him, and he didn't, he caught this. But he did actually, he did actually say this. The morality of the human heroes, those four people I mentioned and everybody else that's mentioned in the book, is suspect at best and sketchy, it's very sketchy, in fact, probably straight out immoral for everybody in the book. There are no heroes in this book. There's a, 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 one of the commentaries I was looking, I was a man by the name of Lewis uh, Patton, he wrote this, there's not one noble character in this book. Another one I was looking at was a, a man by the name of F.B. Huey. I could not figure out what F.B. stood for. I guess he's a, you guys know what F.B. stood for, yeah. Uh, it, 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 everywhere you look, you had, I finally had a guy, second service, I, I said, anybody can figure that out, it's a shiny dime. And he, it's all he did the rest of the service. He figured it out. He found out. Yeah, it stands for Faye Burns. F, it's a guy. F-A-Y. So it's kind of like that Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. This guy's probably one very tough dude, you know, because he's... Anyway, uh, I'd go by F-B, too. So here's what he said about the book. He, he describes all the characters saying, you got to be kidding me. He says, Xerxes was a cruel, sensuous, and capricious... Despot. In other words, he was a, a mean dictator. Esther was willing to hide her identity in order to become a queen and did not appear to be reluctant to marry a Gentile. She showed no mercy when Haman pled for his life and even demanded that his sons be hanged. Not content with deliverance of her people, she and Mordecai, with the king's permission, wrote a decree authorizing their people to slaughter and plunder their enemies. Mordecai advised Esther to conceal her identity in order to become queen. He insolently refused to bow to Haman and joined Esther in bringing vengeance on their enemies. And the author of the book of Esther never explicitly condemns any of the moral shortcomings of Esther or Mordecai, but seems to describe their triumph with approval. Okay? So this is a problem. You're going to look at me like, you better fix this. I, 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 this is a problem. You're, you're asking the question you should be asking. We're going to spend nine more weeks in this book? Are you kidding me? I looked online, different famous preachers, how much time they've spent on it. Uh, up until my friend in St. Cloud, he spent the same amount of time we're going to, 10 weeks. I found, now I found a few other. Mark Driscoll spent some time in it, uh, a few others. But like James McDonald, if you ever hear him, Harvest guy down in, in Chicago. Uh, one sermon, all 10 chapters. Okay, most of the people, not a word on this book. So why are we going to spend nine weeks in this book? Why are we going to do that? Why are we going to spend it in a story where God is not mentioned, God seems silent? What's the deal? With people who are probably all smarmy. Why are we going to do that? Why don't you just tell us what it means, and we'll just move on to the next thing. Because I can't. The story is, when God is, seems silent, he never is. He's always acting. And he is going to take a totally rotten situation, and he will providentially lead you through it. That's the point. There it is. You've got it. Ten seconds. Why are we going to do this in nine weeks? And my answer is, the Lord of the Rings. 
Now, as a family, we own the director's cut or what you'd call the, uh, uh, the uh, what do they call it? Uh, extended version or whatever it's, right? Does anybody know how long is the first one? Anybody else got the extended version? Anybody else? You are all geeks like us. Yes, you are. The extended version. Well, how long is, how long is Fellowship? How long is Fellowship? All director's cut. Four hours. Four hours. How long is Two Towers? Let me know. You can say you own this. You know, watch this. Go home tonight. Watch this. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> About four and a half. Four and a half. Third one, Return of the King, 72 hours. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Some of you believe me there for a second. You're frightening me. Yes. So if you add it up, it's somewhere around 12 some hours of movie. 12 some hours of movie. The uh, humorous James Watkins has shortened it. Here's the movie. In about 15 seconds. Here's the movie. Evil, e evil Lord makes ring. You got that. Uh, let's try to fix it. Okay. Evil Lord makes ring. Evil Lord loses ring. Good Hobbit finds ring. Evil Lord looks for Good Hobbit who has ring. Good Hobbit destroys ring. Movie company makes a whole Middle Earth of money. Okay? <laughs> there it is. That's the movie. I'm sorry if I spoiled it for you. That's the movie. Ten seconds you can get to the movie. Why do you spend 12 hours doing that? Why do you do that? Why? People say, and this is people say, oh, I can't preach a, a 45, 50 minute message anymore. People have short attention spans. No, they don't. No, they don't. You spend two hours on a movie. You, you do. Why are you sucked into that? Why is that? My answer is because it's story. And I think God has wired us such that we work on story. It is no accident that 40% of the Old Testament is all story. It's narrative. And the New Testament, when you come to the point you're going to talk about who Jesus is, four guys got together and said, let's tell about who Jesus is. So they all write gospel accounts. And guess what they are? Story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then how did the church take shape after that? Acts. Then you get all these books that are really kind of story. They're inner, it's really story, but they're letters that it, as these churches got started, but it's kind of part of the story. There's no other genre, which basically means type of literature in the Bible bigger than story or what we call narrative. Why? Just tell me the point. Can't we move on? Really? No, it's not the way we live. We live in story. Because something lands to us in story in 12 hours of watching Lord of the Rings that we walk out and somehow we identify not only intellectually but emotionally, perhaps even with our volition and our will. Something happens to us and we, we feel different. A good movie moves us. Right? That's why we're going to spend nine weeks in this. We're going to land with this. Jesus was a master of this. Jesus was the master of this. Last week, I gave a, a relatively short message and talked about who is Jesus, right? Who are you unified? Uh, we had the baptism service. Who are you unified to? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And remember, I, I quoted from John chapter 10. John chapter 10 comes right after, I want to write this down, John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, he heals a blind man. And there's two responses. Dude, that is really cool. I want to follow you. And dude, you must be demon-possessed. There's two reactions. Instead of getting all huffy and puffy and yelling at him, Jesus does what Jesus does best. And he tells a story. And there's the story. It says a guy comes to a sheep pen where there's a bunch of sheep. Everybody's sheep goes to the sheep pen overnight. And a guy goes in to get his. And when he calls his, they know his name. And they follow him. But those who are not his, they, they, don't, they don't follow him. So guess what? You're going to love me because lovers love, or you're going to hate me because haters hate. Right? That's, that's what he's saying, but he tells a story. And something connects with us on that level in a way that nothing else will. Now, how in the world are you going to take a book that doesn't mention God and want to be, as we've been praying, that at the end of this, we are transformed by God? How's that going to happen? And it becomes because of our understanding and theology or thinking about the whole of Scripture. And I just want to give you five quick things, real quick things, we believe about the Bible 
in its centrality. And Esther fits right in there. But it's not the only book. We'd be in trouble if it was the only book. But it's, it's, it's a part of all of the story from Genesis to Revelation. All right? Five quick things. Five quick things we believe about the Bible and how the book of Esther can actually then change our lives. Here we go. Number one. God is always the main point and the main character, even if he's not mentioned. In the Bible and in your life. Always. Romans 15, 4 and 5. Romans 15, 4 and 5. Paul's teaching the people of Rome and he says, For everything that was written in the past, what's he talking about? He's not talking about any of the New Testament because it isn't even in existence yet. He's talking about the Old Testament. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now keep going here, following. Watch his logic. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's Paul saying? He's saying everything that was written in the past, all the Old Testament, so let me reinsert this now. For Esther was written to teach us, yes, Esther. So that we get endurance and encouragement, and God's going to give that through us, through the scriptures. He's, gonna give, he's also going to give us then a spirit of unity amongst us. The point of it all is so that with one heart and one mind, as a church and as individuals together, we will do something. And with laser-pointed clarity, we will glorify God. Because God's the main point. God's the main point. Though he's not mentioned in Esther, he's still the main point. Still the main character. Second thing. Fundamental belief, very important, is that the Word of God changes lives. Believe this with all our hearts. Uh, believe that, and I hope you'll hear this, you'll, you'll hear a lot of Scripture. The reason for that is the Word of God changes lives. Talking about it, important, very good. The Word of God ultimately changes lives. When I was a new follower of Jesus, I came across this passage, and it's been very instrumental for me. It's God speaking to the prophet Isaiah, and he's saying, just understand that when I, when I work through you, something's going to happen, and that principle is true of the Bible. He says, as the rain and the snow come, this is God speaking, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, saying with the analogy, so just like water comes down and it doesn't evaporate up until it does something, it actually causes seeds and then the seeds grow and you get bread out of the deal. So is my word that comes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The word of God changes life. Esther will change your life. Third thing. All scripture, all scripture, even the books that aren't mentioned much, are very valuable. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed. All of it. Some of it, all of it. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God, or your version might say, that you, O man of God, because he's speaking to a man by the name of Timothy, Paul's training him, and he's saying, you, man of God, you will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What's he telling them? He's saying, spend time in your Bible. What's the only Bible they have at this time? It can't be the New Testament yet, because he's writing the New Testament right here as he's talking to, to, to Timothy. He's talking about the Old Testament. All Scripture. Esther is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Fourth thing. All Scripture, all Scripture points ultimately some directly and some not quite as directly, more indirectly, but at all points to Jesus Christ. Jesus is talking to some theologians and religious rulers of his day in John chapter 5, and uh, he tells them, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. They're a shout forward, yet... You refuse to come to me to have life. 
all of this, all the Old Testament and the New Testament, point forward to a coming Messiah, to someone who's going to be uh, known as the Christ. The second person in the Trinity comes to earth, lives amongst us, so that as a good shepherd, he could call us to himself, and then he says he dies. The good shepherd dies for the sheep. He goes to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He dies. He goes into a tomb. We think, game over. Easter Sunday happens. And the stone is rolled away. And now he reigns. All of Scripture points to that. That's who he is. In fact, when he's risen from the dead, and he's walking on the earth before his ascension, he meets up with a couple guys who don't recognize him. And they're trying to describe what's happening to them, and Jesus says to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. The Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. And then lastly, and this one is a fundamental belief we have as people who are followers of the New Testament, followers of Jesus, we believe that the mystery of the gospel is not only that God cared enough about us to send his son, and that's what this table represents, and we're going to move to that in just a few minutes here. This table represents the, the body, which is the, the bread, and the cup, which is the blood of Jesus. Not only that, there's actually a mystery involved. And the mystery is the fact that people who aren't Jewish, aren't physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are actually on level playing ground as Jewish people. The gospel proclaims that the kingdom of God includes non-Jews as well. Paul's writing in the book of Ephesians, and he says this to them. He says, in reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So all the stuff in the Old Testament, it was kind of hinted at. It was a testify, but they didn't really put the pieces together. And here you go. Verse 6, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, is a huge verse. It's like watching the movie, uh, The Sixth Sense, and realizing, oh my gosh, I see dead people. Because <laughs> everything changes with this verse. This mystery is... Come. That through the gospel, the Gentiles, non-Jews, are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. You don't have to become Jewish in order to become acceptable to God. What? How does that fit with you? You've got to read the Old Testament. Wait, what? How do you read Esther, which is a book about Jewish nationalism? We're going to read that. We're going to follow it through. There'll be themes that develop every week, and we will follow it all the way through. Now, let me close, and I'll open up for questions in just a few minutes. Let me close by giving you a gospel application. It's going to be different than I've, I don't know if I've ever done it this way before. <laughs> so, I've been told, and this is, this, is a, this is not the most interesting stuff. A lot of background, a lot of history, da 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 When's he going to stop? So, I've been told that when you lose your audience, either put up pictures of little kids or pictures of puppy dogs. So, here's a puppy dog, okay? This is my dog, Dakota. This is her actual Craigslist uh, ad that I got the dog off of. We got Dakota in December of this year. I decided to, we've been looking for a dog, but kind of surprised the boys. I have three boys, two of which are in college, and they'd be able to spend uh, three and a half weeks with her because they were off in college. We decided to do it for Christmas. So I started looking for a beagle. We, were, we fell in love with the beagle uh, brand, whatever you call it, <laughs> breed. And, and uh, so this is Dakota. That's the, that's the Craigslist picture of Dakota. It says in the, uh, the if you, it's a little hard for you to read, obviously, but uh, they were letting Dakota go. Uh, she was born in May. So we're just picking, uh, her, her name is Dakota. They named her Dakota, and I like that name, so we kept it. We've had one other used dog before. Uh, that we didn't like their name and we changed it. But this one I kind of like Dakota. And because her birthday is in May, we're just saying May 6th is her birthday and we're calling it Cinco Dakota. Okay, anyway. So uh, 
there she is, right? I had to pay $150 for her, uh, and which I did. She came with a crate, uh, and it was a good deal. It said in, the, in here that their living situation had changed, and so they couldn't handle her anymore. I asked her about that. Oh, are you moving? She said, no, we just need her gone. <laughs> it's like, oh, how did your living situation... Okay, whatever. So they told me over the phone. I said, well, is she... I asked a bunch of questions, you know. I said, is she potty trained? And the guy said, well, about 80%. <laughs> now, anytime you buy anything, there's what they call a halo effect. In other words, you're going to say things are about double as good as they really are, just to sell it. 80% means if she happens to be outside when she has to go, she goes. But if she happens to be inside, she goes there. So this dog came, I'm serious, dumb as a stump. Dumb as a, didn't know her name. Didn't know anything. Nothing. Didn't know sit, didn't know come, didn't know potty, didn't know anything. So we had to start from ground zero with Dakota. Now, we are dog, we are suckers for dogs. We love Dakota like crazy. That's the first picture we took of her. Not the greatest picture, but you can see that tail is blurred. <laughs> she's always, always happy. She's just, uh, not right now, actually, that's a lie. Right now, she just got spayed on Friday, so she's <laughs> very sad. We had to get one of those cone things for her so she wouldn't lick her incision. Oh, my gosh. She just looks at me like she's kind of, <laughs> are you kidding me? She is really sad. Anyway, um, she has fit right into our family. There's a picture of her. Of the furry one there on the on your left is, is Dakota. The uh, we also gained a son there. That's the one on the on the far right is is Patrick the the uh, no far left excuse me Patrick the Slovak and uh, Patrick is is he was a foreign exchange student we had. He fell in love with Dakota. Uh, and in fact, we got this picture of him right away when we got, and they're they are having a major wrestling match. And she's got those really sharp little puppy teeth. Ooh, it's just vicious. Um, my wife took this picture. This is my son, David. Many of you know David. Uh, David's uh, Iowa State senior this year, and that's his girlfriend. Uh, right, I call it the quote of my girlfriend, so it's Brittany uh, next to him. And uh, they're both seniors this year. And Dakota is there, and he fell in love with the boys when they were home. Uh, he, she loves to cuddle. Uh, she loved it. My son, John, has these weird hours. That's my middle son. I have no picture of him to prove the exact. I guess he was in that other one. He, he, uh, he loves to stay up till about 4 a.m., likes to sleep until 1, and she would just snuggle with him all the time. Okay? As my wife is taking this picture, this very picture right here, and as she's editing it, taking out the red eye and posting it on Facebook, she texts me. Actually, to be accurate, she Facebooks me, and I, I bloop, up comes on my screen. Now, the weird thing about this is, is I'm downstairs, and she's on the middle floor. So you learn something about the Trichler family here. But so she, she's on the middle floor, and, and I know she's on the computer because she's, she's Facebooking me, and I, I see this come up, and she says, where's Dakota? And I said, well, she's not with me. And she says, well, she's not with me either. To which I then said, that's not good. This is where Dakota was. <laughs> Dakota just decided that the stuffing on the inside of the couch looked better on the outside of the couch. And she just went at the couch and just started ripping it completely apart. Now, I, the, the cool thing is, I've always hated this couch. Uh, Carol's never let me get rid of this couch, so I put bacon grease all over it, just hoping the dog would go after me. <laughs> Now, let me ask you something. Do you know Dakota? I told you a bunch of facts about her, how much I paid for her. She had a crate she came with, wasn't potty trained. She's a beagle. She was born in May. Uh, I got her from someone uh, that she fit into our family. She's, her tail wave, wags a mile a minute, right? You get some facts about her, and facts are important. Facts are important things to, to start to get to uh, wrap your head around a concept, right? I also did something else. I told you a story about Dakota. I told you a story. I said, hey, this happened, and, and she was, she's just a fun, cuddly thing. And as my wife was loving on her, and what a cute dog, and all she's out there destroying. So you know, she's mischievous, and you feel like you have a connection with her, right? You kind of do. You 
because you have this story, right? A lot of you, as hope has grown, I haven't got a chance to get to know everybody. And I'm just like one of those people that kind of, blah, wears everything on my sleeve and, and shares my story. And so some of you feel like you kind of know me. And you do know some things about me because I've shared story with you. But you don't really know me. You know about me. You know facts about me. You know that I'm from the Iron Range and I came down here in uh, 1982 and became a follower of Jesus in 1983 and worked for the Navigators and then went to seminary and started a church in 1996 and blah, blah, married and have three kids and blah, 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 blah. Right? You know facts. And you know some of my stories. But what's missing? What's missing is you have facts, you have my story, but we don't have our story. If our lives were to interact, and I would hear your story, and we'd actually create a story, we'd maybe go do something, go mini-golfing, or we'd, we'd go shoot something, <laughs> uh, <laughs> go shoot trap, or, or we'd, we'd, whatever, we'd do something together. Our story, we'd have like this, because now our lives would, over, would cross. I got a challenge for you. This is my question. All that's a lead up to the question. A lot of us know doctrine about God, who he is, he's loving, he's kind, he's just, he's merciful, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's got all these provident, he's sovereign, da, 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 da. we got all that, got the facts. And then we read the Bible and we learn stories about God, and that's really good. And I want to invite you into the story of Esther. But just the same way you can watch a movie and have a, have a connection with it, don't get duped into thinking you've really got a connection with it. Because much as I like Lord of the Rings, I've never met a hobbit. <laughs> it's only going to happen when we have our story together. So you might think you know an actor, you might think you know an athlete by knowing all about them and maybe knowing some of their stories or achievements, but until you have a connection with them, you don't. So my encouragement over the next nine weeks, and my invitation to you is this. Let's write a story. Where is God in your story? We want to know facts. We want to follow the story of Esther. But if you just follow the story and you don't allow it to intersect with you, you won't really get to know Dakota. You won't really get to know God. Now, with that said, before we move to a time response, I'll open up for a few questions. I don't, uh, whatever you want to ask at all, I'm happy to do my best in trying to, to follow anything you'd want to ask. Yes, we still have the couch. <laughs> yes, sir. I really don't. Some people think Ezra might have. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those deals where you can read and read and read. Authorship and commentaries are sometimes 20 pages long, and almost all the good ones say, we don't know. So I'll just cut to the chase. I don't know. Yeah. That's a great question, though. Yeah. <laughs> good. There's one question I can't think of. Anybody else? Well, great. Let that land. When God wanted to redeem us, when God wanted to ultimately show his love for you, he did it in story. He didn't just give you a text message in the sky or anything like that. He did it in story. And he told us to remember it in a very tactile way, a way that we get to touch and feel. Communion. It's a story. So as you come tonight, to take communion. We practice open communion. It's open to everybody here. All we ask is that you're a follower of Jesus. And if you're not yet, right where you're at. Tonight might be your night where your story intersects with Jesus Christ. And then you come and take communion. You just simply where you're at. Do business with him and say, I need you as my Savior. I need you as my Lord. I want to follow you as my guide for living. I've heard a guy talk about that before. Then you can... Come and take your first communion as a follower of Jesus. As you're doing that, though, think about the story. Think about what this represents. Think about what our Lord and Savior did for you, how much he loves you, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
Use this time as a time of response. Let's pray together.